Hey, what's going on, folks? Tonight, I'm joined by former vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party, Spike Cohen, to have a friendly conversation and debate about libertarianism, the things we agree with, the things we know the Republican Party isn't doing, and then some interesting policies of libertarians, such as abolishing ICE, possibly abolishing police, and making it private, and whatever comes up in the conversation. Hope you stick around and enjoy this one. The show starts now. I hope that uh, this r reminds us of the fact that prior to the deification of Anthony Fauci uh, during uh, the co beginning of the COVID pandemic, that Anthony Fauci has always been the bad guy. I I've talked multiple times on this uh, August program here about the fact that the 80s gay panic was largely caused by Anthony Fauci going on major media and saying that it was at least possible that AIDS could be spread from casual contact with gay men, even though there was no evidence of that ever. There was no suggestion that that was true ever. He was the one spreading that. And it's the Dream Rare Podcast. Welcome to the show. The way to get the news at the desk or on the road. Let's go. God is great and success in our control. The world is crazy, but we get better from obstacles. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Dream Rare Podcast. I'm here live with Spike Cohen, the former vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. And is that a good intro? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm also the founder and president of You Are the Power, and we'll probably get into that at some point, too. Cool. First, I noticed when I was making the thumbnail that your name is Spike and the libertarian is like a porcupine, which is spiky. Has anyone brought that up or am I the first one? <laughs> no, uh, it's been a while since someone's brought that up. But during the campaign, it was brought up a lot. They're, they're not related at all. They chose the the uh, the porcupine long before I came around. But yeah, it, it, it's uh that's uh, a few people have pointed that out. Yeah. OK, I'm not the first. Well, I want to start with <laughs> stuff that I know we agree on and things because I'm not uh, I'm a registered Republican, but I do tend okay. to be libertarian on a lot of issues. I think the first one is income tax. Anytime I say libertarians are right on income tax, they usually share my tweet. What do you think about income tax? <laughs> like just in general, how high it is? All taxation is extortion. That includes income tax. Now, income tax is a, a, an especially horrific version where they punish you for earning an income and providing for yourself and your loved ones. Uh, I know some people who argue that a sales tax is somewhat better because you're choosing to buy stuff as though you can't you could choose not to buy things, but it's definitely a terrible thing. Uh, it, uh, you know, they say that that taxes and, and fees and things like that, the government levies those things on people to try to discourage them from doing them. That's why there's higher taxes on alcohol and, and tobacco and things like that. Why are they taxing people for earning a living? and working and providing for themselves and, and their loved ones and their families. Uh, I think it's an absolutely terrible thing. I wish that the Republican Party were serious. You know, right now they're talking about uh, voting to abolish the IRS or, or have a 0% income tax. We all know they're doing it because they have no way of actually doing it. It'll be, it probably <laughs> won't even pass the House. It'll definitely be killed in the Senate. Uh, if they actually believe that, there's been times in the past that the Republican Party has had control of the entire government from Congress to the White House, and, and they never did such a thing. But uh, I, I, I like that they're even talking about it. And all, all income tax, all taxes are extortion. And if government can't find a way to fund itself the same way the rest of us do through voluntary means, then that says something about them. Right. I always say that Republicans campaign as libertarians and then they end up like governing like governing as Democrats or yeah. Democrats. <laughs> yeah. And with the taxes, you know, I read Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. and One thing in it was mm. he wanted a progressive uh, graduated income tax. And at the time when he wrote it, there actually was no income tax. So I, I yes. think if you could have told Karl Marx, hey, like even they're taxing 10 or 15 percent, he would have been like, this is great. That's way Mission higher than I ever yeah. thought. Yeah, but 30 percent, 35 and the Republicans, yep. it's like, we'll give you 38 instead of 40 percent. Um, yeah. It's crazy to me. And I guess just to play the other side, you know, I, I heard today because I mentioned something on a Republican page and they were like, well, how would we fund the military? So what, what do you think about that? If they didn't steal our income tax, how would they fund our military? Well, the thing is, the reality is everyone has to be everyone except government and organized crime. I repeat myself, uh, they find voluntary ways to fund things. And I think a voluntary way to fund government could be something in the form of almost like a, a warranty, uh, a, a volunteer transfer uh, fee on any kind of goods and services that you purchase. Anything that involves money, whether it's buying someone's labor, buying a product from someone or a service or something else where you could choose not to purchase that thing 
But if you don't purchase it, then you don't have any kind of protection for liability or anything else. So like an example I use is if I sell you a used car for $10,000 and the fee is, let's say it's a, you know, a 10% fee or a 5% fee or, or whatever, we could choose, you could choose to pay it. I could choose to pay it. We could split the difference uh, or we could not pay it. But if no one pays it and that car ends up being a lemon and I say, hey, pal, you're on your own. You, you bought the car. It's, it's yours. Um, you couldn't use the court system to try to go after me or anything like that. Now, there would be certain things that would be mandated that would and that would come from that funding. But there'd be certain things you wouldn't have access to by doing it that way. That makes it so that whatever that fee is has to be just enough where it's still people voluntarily decide that it's worth it to pay that if right now the net tax burden on the uh, by of the American government is around 40%. If you put a 40% fee on everything, most people would say, Hey, you know what? I'll take my odds with the, with the car. I'll take my odds with this piece of this uh, loaf of bread or this apple that I'm buying. But if it's a reasonable amount, then most people are going to be willing to pay it. That forces government to do what the rest of us do live within our means and provide more value than what we cost. Right. I think libertarians and Republicans both agree that government has gotten too big. It's just Republicans just keep bloating it every time they win and li and libertarians <laughs> don't win. So, you know, there's yes. quite and the that's the problem. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Republicans the win and then and then do it's the it's the eternal paradox. Uh, both of us agree that for the at least for the most part, that government's too big. Republicans, like you said, they 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 contribute to it being bigger and libertarians don't win. And so uh, it is what it is. But yeah, right. I know libertarians are very strict Second Amendment advocates. They believe the government should pretty much completely stay out of that. And I thought your tweet yeah. was interesting about the ATF and Trump. I wanted to hear you explain that real quick, because yeah, you yeah. Know, as a lot of gun advocates know, some people didn't care. A lot of people did. You know, Trump uh, basically used his leverage to ban bump stocks. And after one of like maybe a school shooting or a tragedy, he used that kind of emotional you know, baggage as leverage to try to rule yep. out bump stocks. And I believe the courts recently uh, said that was unconstitutional. Struck so. it down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, I said uh, Trump is worse than the ATF and I uh, got a, a little bit of conservative pushback <laughs> on that. And, and here's what I mean by that. Uh, during the Barack Obama administration, Barack Obama uh, wrote to ATF or how, you know, went to ATF and said, uh, is is there a way to ban bump stocks? Is it can it be considered a machine gun? The ATF, their their attorneys, their people looked at it and said, no, there's no real conceivable way to consider a bump stock a machine gun. And therefore, within the current set of rules, there's no way for us to the, the current set of laws. There's no way for us to ban it. By the way, we can thank uh, Ronald Reagan for that ban uh, on machine guns. But anyway, uh, so when Donald Trump came in and this was after the Las Vegas shooting, he put pressure on the ATF to reverse course and rule that it was in fact a machine, that it did in fact turn a gun into a machine gun, meaning that a bump stock is a machine gun and that therefore it could be banned. And so they did that. And what this court ruled was that under tremendous pressure from the Trump administration, the ATF reversed course and did this ban. Now, thankfully, they've, they've overturned it. But the thing is, if you've been following Donald Trump through his whole life back before back when he was a, a, a liberal Democrat, uh, New York City Democrat, uh, all of a sudden turned into a, a conservative Republican. The reality is he's always been in favor of gun control. He was in favor of assault weapons, so-called assault weapons ban. Uh, even as a Republican, he famously said that he supported red flag laws, that we needed to take the guns first and due process later. And, and he supported uh, bans on bump stocks and other accessories. So, I mean, uh, the reality is the proof's in the pudding. Under Barack Obama, we actually, despite all the anti-gun rhetoric, we actually saw a net reduction in federal laws and regulations regarding guns. And during Donald Trump, we saw an increase. Right. And it's hard for people to process that because, it, you know, especially <laughs> if this is factually provable, you could look it up. It's like, yeah, I wish it wasn't that. But if it was yeah. that, like people don't <laughs> want to process it. And sometimes yeah. I think the old saying actions matter louder than words, even yes. with um, Biden, I can't remember exactly what it was recently, maybe the omnibus bill. And like Republicans are like, I'm fed up. And I'm like, me too. But, I, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, Trump signed yes. every single one. And it's almost like you have to lose in order for Republicans to pretend like they care about stuff that they dropped the ball on when they had power. 
Almost. I mean, it used to be back in the day that, you know, if the Democrats were out of power, they were suddenly against the abuse of authority and all this corruption they saw. And Republicans were out of power. They were against the the national debt and and all of that um, and the increase in the deficit and everything. Over time, it just seems like they just it's more about if they're out of power, they just say the other side's bad. They don't even pretend to take a stake on these things. But yeah, I mean, it, the reality is uh, on many things uh, and spending is definitely one of them. Donald Trump ran up seven trillion dollars in debt in one term. And yes, a lot of that had to do with covid, which was his fault, because under Anthony Fauci, which was his employee, they were guiding the states into the lockdowns and all the nonsense that led to the stimulus spending and everything. But but even before that, he was already outpacing Barack Obama, who was previously the record holder for deficit spending year over year over year. And this was 17, 18, 19 be before covid-19 and the lockdowns and all of that. And for the I've had many people who say, oh, well, he was just doing that because of all the public pressure. You know, the liberals were putting pressure on him. Well, that makes it worse. If, if someone is willing to do things that they know are wrong because the other side is demanding it of them, then what the hell good are they? Not, that's my take on that. Yeah, I, I hear you, man. I've, I've gotten a lot of backlash since 2020, 2021, where there's all these excuse, excuses being made. It's yep. 5D chess. He gave to, he tried to appease the left wing media. It's like, I guess, call me a way. hard liner or something, but I just don't care. I, I wish the base cared about stopping it more than making yes. excuses because it's been like 40 years of Republicans being uh, Democrats. I agree on that. Before my next thing, I just want to ask you, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I want to hear your take on it. As far as free speech in the First Amendment, you know, I see the Democrats are always trying to basically they're, they're not even liberal anymore. Now it's like everything's hate speech or you can't say that because it criticizes big pharma, you know, big tech crackdowns, um, hate speech under the guise of like anti LGBT stuff. And then the right wing, which a lot of people don't know about, but under Trump. Uh, him and DeSantis passed these like uh, anti-Semitism speech laws, which kind of have 30 yes. different definitions yep. of them, quashing yep. protests, some really interesting stuff. And I think uh, the left obviously doesn't care about speech infringements that benefit them. And the right doesn't care about speech infringements that benefit them. What, what's the libertarian stance on, you know, tr true free speech and protests? Pretty much everything you just said. I mean, that, the reality is uh, when people are in power and someone is saying something they don't like, the natural impulse of people that with this amount of power and this little amount of accountability who know that the worst thing that's going to happen is this party's going to get put in charge where now they're the junior partner instead of the senior partner, their impulse is to quiet people and to silence people. And I'm glad you brought up the anti-BDS, the so-called anti uh, anti anti Semitism uh, uh, laws is that when they're saying anti Semitism, they're talking about um, they're talking about criticism of Israel. They're talking about criticism of a government, a foreign government, but a government. I'm Jewish, so I just want to put that out there. I'm Jewish. I am. You will be hard pressed to find a greater critic of the policies of Israel and and more importantly, U.S. policies in relation to Israel and in the Middle East and the so-called war on terror and all of that. You'll be hard pressed to find a greater critic to, than me. Does that make me an anti-Semite? Yes. Does that make me? <laughs> yeah, yes. Apparently no. so. Spike Cohen, noted neo-Nazi far-right anti-Semite. But that's the problem, right? And I'm glad you brought that up because that is a problem. Now, there is real anti-Semitism and, and real anti-Judaism. And here's the thing. I don't like that there are people that are anti-Semitic. They have a right to say it. I don't want to associate with them, but they have a right to say it, right? Like that, it shouldn't be criminalized. You know, the best way to show people that Jews aren't in control of everything is to throw them in jail if they say anything negative about you. That'll show them that that, that they were wrong. <laughs> I mean, listen. So, right. I, I, but but I will say, when it comes to uh, whatever the the guise is that people are using to try to silence people or criminalize their speech or their thoughts, whatever the pretext is. You are giving government the power to tell you what you can or cannot say. Anytime you give government power, more power or more authority, whatever the pretext, you're basically giving them another gun and they will inevitably turn that gun around on you. Sometimes immediately turn that gun around on you. Stop giving. I am in favor of common sense government control. Stop giving more guns and power to government. Yeah, man, I think the left has a blind spot with like uh, BLM type stuff and racism where they'll they'll quickly be like, oh, what do you you must be a racist if you don't like this. And it's like, it's not that it's yeah. just, you know, this is a broad brush. I Like now they're saying like toilet paper is racist. I actually read an article, no joke, uh, that said that <laughs> if, if you take 
Wait, no, no, no. Um, this one even gets worse than toilet paper. It's DM the DMT elves that you apparently see when you do DMT. The DMT yeah. elves are racist. They're really writing that article now. We're saying like, you know, certain black people have had an experience taking DMT <laughs> where there's racism in the world of DMT. And I'm like, I thought it was like Babylon B, but it must be some like, I don't know. I'll have to revisit that. But the say, DMT elves are racist. Right. Uh, so with that on the left and then on the right, I think their blind spots anti-Semitism, where if you stand up to these laws or rules, they'll they'll just suggest you're an anti-Semite. But of course, right. you know, I don't think if you read the anti-Semitism rules, they're not to protect you or my friends. It's more like oligarchs, media, bankers, you know, high level people. The military industrial complex. Yes. If, if you critique the fact that a, a country is basically an extension of the U.S. military uh, that can carry out U.S. military goals as a proxy, well, that's anti-Semitism. Why? Because most of them are Jews in that particular country. Now, it's interesting because I we will make similar criticisms of Saudi Arabia and what they're doing in Yemen and their association with Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. And as far as I've seen, no one has accused that us of being Islamophobic for bringing that up. Right. Or, right. you know, if, if we're, if we're criticizing uh, U S policy uh, and, and the U S is a, a majority Christian country, or at least right now it is, that's not Christophobic to say that either. I, I, right. I reject that outright. And in fact, when you do that, when you say that criticism of, of any of a specific thing is anti-Semitic, even if it's not in and of itself anti-Semitic, you're pushing them into a camp of anti-Semites mm. who actually probably agree with you on that thing. I doubt that there are many pro-Israel anti-Semites, right? So now here you are, you're pushing them into that camp and then saying, ha, I knew it. They were always part of that camp. No, you pushed them out of that and said that their behavior should be criminalized uh, or banned from social media or, or treated as some kind of hate crime. And so, okay, now they're now you're pushing them into that camp, or at the very least, you're you're marginalizing them for having what should be, in my opinion, a mainstream opinion when it comes to uh, U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the the Middle East. Right, I hear you. I know um, Trump's Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, said like anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, and uh, the Republican Party cracks down really heavy on that type of stuff. And exactly what you said is true. It's like, if you try to bring up, I'm against speech laws, or perhaps you have like a foreign policy disagreement and you keep calling people anti-Semites and you say yeah. you're not welcome, they're eventually gonna go to places that people will wanna hear them. And you know, it's like you are pushing them in a corner. Why do you think the Republican- You're certainly encouraging it at the very least. Why do you think Republican party does that? Like passes speech laws and, and those type of laws, and, you know, wh why do you think they do that? And why do you think the Republican like base doesn't care that much? I think, well, the base doesn't care that much because they're caught up in the same duopoly team sports nonsense, right? Like if Donald Trump passes a multi-trillion dollar bill that is going to cause massive amounts of inflation, he really dunked on the libs there. They thought they were going to outspend Trump and he showed them. It's, it's team sports, <laughs> right? It's 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 right. red versus blue. And at least with team sports, the people you're cheering on don't you know threaten to destroy your life in the process, right? But So this is like a really bad version of team sports. Why does the Republican Party do it? The easiest answer is because they can, they can get away with it. I'd say a, a, a more complex answer is I believe that the Republican and Democrat parties are no such thing. They aren't really, they're separate in that, yeah, the Democrats want to be the, the senior partners and the Republicans want to be the senior partners, but they recognize that they need the other one as a partner. They want them to be the junior partner because the reality is the United States government, the central banking system, the entire thing is really just an oligarchy that is run for the benefit of a relatively small handful of incredibly powerful and cynical people, the elites that control everything. You know, uh, when, when COVID happens and, and lockdowns are implemented, and there are people saying, please, I need money to be able to afford to eat. The bulk of that stimulus spending was handed to multi-billion dollar corporations, multinational corporations, the biggest wealth transfer from those with the least to those with the most. So, so going back to your question, if any time that the Democrats do something, it's ultimately to benefit the state, the government. When Republicans do something, whatever the pretext is on either side, it is to benefit the state. And they're playing a good cop, bad cop routine. They're playing this routine of saying, okay, listen, I know you don't like everything I do. I know that I keep failing you, but if you don't vote for me, you're going to get this guy over here. You know, my partner that I work with every day to screw you over, you're going to get him and it's going to be way worse. And of course, they're saying the same thing on the other side. And that's why when you try to have this discussion about Donald Trump being to this day, the worst 
single term debt spender in American history, being one of the most unfriendly to the Second Amendment presidents we've had uh, in, in most people's lifetimes, uh, certainly since uh, since I would say even uh, Carter um, and, and probably even uh, since before that. If you bring these things up, if you bring up the fact that it was his CDC, Anthony right. Fauci, his employee who guided the states through lockdown plans that had been written in 2005 under the Bush administration to deal with the bird flu. When you bring these things up, they go, yeah, yeah, but the Democrats. Well, congratulations, you've fallen for the scam. <laughs> right. And to add to that, his FDA director was a, or commissioner was Scott Gottlieb, who left to yep. go to Pfizer. And now he's in the Twitter <laughs> files. And his HHS pick was an Eli Lilly executive and a former pharmacy lobbyist, Alex Azar. So, I mean, yeah, Trump and that's nothing new. That's not like just Trump. That's nothing new. Uh, the the FDA, basically the health industrial complex within the, the government is just an extension of big pharma in the same way that the military industrial complex uh, within the Pentagon and within the, the U.S. military is just an extension of the defense contractors. It, it's interesting. People on the left will correctly say that we live in a fascist system, but it's not the parts they're talking about. What the reality is, our system is a marriage of big government and big business. When the Tea Party was out protesting at, uh, back in the uh, what late 2000s and the Occupy Wall Street was out protesting during that same time, they were literally protesting the exact same thing, just two different heads of the same monster. And that monster is fascism. We are in a quasi fascist system. I want to go over a few things. And then at the end, I before we end it, not that we're close, I just want to make sure I put this out there so I don't forget it. I want to yeah. talk about how Republic, I mean, how libertarians can actually be like a force, because I, I think, Good. you know, Good. they could, yeah, they could counter Republicans heavy. I mean, I'm probably just as much libertarian as re Republican, because when they print all the money, when they do all these infringements, I feel like people don't recognize it. And when you do, they freak out, which is weird. I think you nailed it with the two party thing. But I want to read a few things and then get into some things that we might disagree on. I'm not even sure yet. Sure, sure. Well, a lot yeah, of people yeah. with certain government things you think in your head, right, that has to be there. Like, what could we do without it? But the, I just wrote <laughs> these down before the um, interview. Department sure. of Education was created on October 17th, 1979. So even yeah. though it seems like we need a Department of Education, well, <laughs> what happened for the first 200 years of America? Clear, We, we were fine. No education. There was no education before October of 1979. Now, it's interesting since in the what is that? Uh, 30, uh, 41 years, 43 years. God, man, I'm getting old in the in the 43 years since the Department of Education was created. And in the I, I want to say adjusted for inflation, something like three or four trillion dollars that they've spent during that time. All of the metrics that are used to judge the quality of education, test scores, um, uh, mathematic pr uh, proficiency uh, scores, uh, literacy scores, uh, child to student to teacher ratios, all of them have gotten worse. The right. U.S. went from being, by some measures, number one in education to being somewhere in the teens or 20s. And it is precisely because education was turned into a federal bureaucracy. Now, during that time, they've spent all of this money and they've created a uh, a narrative in this country that without the federal government being involved in education, education would fall apart, despite every bit of e evidence that shows that it was the Department of Education, followed by uh, No Child Left Behind, followed by Common Core and all of these things. That is why the system is as bad as it is. I mean, there's always been problems in education. Obviously, any system can be improved upon. Getting the federal government involved has done the opposite of every stated goal that it had. Right. And it's only the Department of Education has only been there since 1979. As Spike is talking about, the government keep infringing more and more and more. I would think that a majority of Americans would agree that schools are worse than they've ever been. And like you said, the test scores prove it. So I saw yep. the libertarian uh, Twitter say abolish ICE, which is also happens to be a, a policy of like the progressive left, the AOCs, the Ilhan Omars. So I took yeah, a yeah. look, I wanted to look up, and I didn't actually know this before a couple of days ago, that the Department of Homeland Security was actually created on uh, November 25th, 2002, after the 9-11. Uh, so there actually yes. wasn't a Department of Homeland Security before that. And ICE was created in March 2003. Uh, yep. and, and ironically, I'm not saying it's ICE's fault, because um, I think there are some ICE members that do some good work, but the border's worse than it's ever been. 
And, uh, you know, I think there's <laughs> many reasons because of that. But, yes, yes you know, yes. so is that a policy of the Libertarian Party to abolish ICE? And what would you yeah. replace it with or, or what would you put there? Yeah, so it, it is because here's the problem. And and uh, the people, when Democrats talk about this, they want to pretend there's not a crisis on the border uh, or that the crisis on the border didn't exist until Donald Trump became president or, or whatever other nonsense they've said. What's interesting is that, you know, Joe Biden said when he got into office, he wasn't going to fund one more inch uh, of the wall. And instead, his administration has continued using eminent domain to steal private property from people in court specifically so they can continue building the wall that was started under Trump. So that's an interesting note there, there being no difference between Republicans and Democrats. First of all, the surge that's happening on the border is largely happening thanks to the CIA and uh, the US uh, intelligence services and the US drug enforcement services uh, sponsoring drug cartels and puppet governments who are engaging in massive amounts of political and gang violence in Central and South America and parts of Mexico, which is leading entire communities to flee the, the violence or even to send their children off with strangers, coyotes, in the vain hope that they'll actually get to a cage, or I'm sorry, Joe Biden's president, to a shelter uh, on the border because uh, they know that that uncertain fate is certainly better than staying home and being slaughtered on mass along with everything else. And that is as a direct result of the war on drugs and other U.S. Uh, foreign interventions in sovereign nations in, in Latin America. So that surge is happening as a direct result of U.S. and Western uh, policy, especially when it comes to the war on drugs. That would even be happening if it wasn't for that. When they get to the border, they deal with the fact that the only way to get across the border is to work with cartels, smuggling cartels, coyotes and so forth, or to just, you know, basically run in uh, wholesale with multiple people running in it all at the same time, because there's a, a, a system put in place saying, unlike my ancestors, probably your ancestors, many of the people that have come here, where we would simply have them come here, give us a basic amount of information, and then they were on their way. Instead, if, you know, the, the legal immigration process for most people in Latin America is no. They don't qualify. They don't have a bunch of money. They don't have a, a skilled a job visa waiting for them. They don't have anyone here that wants to marry them or sponsor them or even knows them. And so there's literally no way for them to come here except under asylum. Then when they get here, they're not allowed to work. So they're put on the welfare state or they're put in, sorry, it's not a cage, in a shelter. I, I look forward to a Republican being president again so we can call it a cage again, but being put in those which cost something like $800 per person per day, far more than even the most lavish welfare state system. If instead we said, listen, if, first of all, we're going to stop destabilizing your home countries so you don't flee here to get away from the violence. But second of all, if you get here. And unless we have an overwhelming reason to believe that that you're a threat, you can come here, you can work, you're not going to be on welfare, there is nothing free here for you other than opportunities to be able to do well, there would be far fewer people coming here, the ones coming here would be coming solely to be able to provide for their families and, and build a better life, and there wouldn't be any kind of, we, the taxpayer wouldn't be on the hook to pay for their cradle to grave needs, and, and, and that, that's my policy on that. I think that definitely the non-intervention and the U.S. is definitely involved in a lot of Latin American countries. I agree yeah. with that. However, I don't know that the number would be that close to zero because of the economic opportunity in America. Also, oh, it wouldn't I, be zero. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, yeah. too, that a lot of the surge, I, I don't even know if it's that people are fleeing for the first time or fleeing poverty or what do you think about the fact that somebody's kind of sponsoring it? Like when you have a caravan of 7,000 people, that's not natural. People have been breaking into America for 50 years now, but there's never been this like there's 7,000 people marching from this country here and the news is on it. You know, is it possible that somebody's uh, orchestrating these sort of like mass migration movements? Because I feel like that's I mean, a huge part of it. It's certainly possible. I will say this, whether or not it's actually the the thing itself is being orchestrated, it's certainly media is glomming onto it to to sell a particular narrative. But I will say this. I mean, during the time that my my father's side of the family was coming here, people were coming here in gigantic boatloads where they had to devote an entire island to processing them. So, I mean, there have certainly been major surges and, th and those weren't orchestrated. It was people fleeing, often fleeing political violence or just or just coming for a, a better opportunity. And no, I, I wouldn't say that there's ever going to be 
net zero immigration, even if you put a giant wall on the border and banned all immigration from the southern border up, it would still happen, even if it was happening illegally. But I also don't think that there's a, a threat to people coming here to provide a better life. What there's a threat to is creating a, a massive cartel presence on the south of the border. And then between the surges in, in, in violence, which are leading surges of people to come here, and also the surges of those cartels coming here and those chickens coming home to roost of U.S. government policy, that's the danger here. But but the danger isn't that some guy or some family uh, who wants to come here and, and you know, work in a, in a, you know, a meat processing plant or something that doesn't pose a threat to anyone. That's, right, but that's actually million, from the long history. of it. But if hundreds of thousands of people are coming a month, it's not just like a, one guy working in a meat packing. It's like, you know, just even even sending like I think they sent a couple thousand people to New York. And all of a sudden the Democrat mayor there went from let him in, let him in to this yes. is a crisis because it's weighing on yep. his state system. On I want to state I, system on I the welfare do, system. Yeah, I want to do a hypothetical. Okay, say that yeah, yeah. someone gets an office that's not, uh, you know, a regime change like American leader that wants to regime change fifty countries. We stop messing right. around in South America, Central America, Mexico, and the world is still not perfect, right? Even though we're not messing around there, like there's oh, of still, course, there's yeah. still going to be countries where there's going to be destabilization. There's going to be poverty. There's going to be more opportunity in America. So say we still have people coming mm -hmm. across the border. How would how would a libertarian uh, defend the border or what would be their policy? Because, there, you know, say there's still people coming across, even though the regime change stuff has ended. Right. So, uh, I, I mean, uh, the short answer is our policy would be that of the founders. Uh, the founders recognized that even if you have a high bar for naturalization, they didn't really care who came here, provided they weren't a, a threat to the public. You mentioned people invading for the last 50 years. What's actually happened is that what was once seen as something that wasn't really much of the government's business to begin with suddenly was. In fact, I've actually talked to people whose parents and grandparents, when they first came here, they would just walk across the or, or, or drive across the border and do seasonal labor and then go home when they started saying oh no you can't do that uh and so they started like putting up these these uh checkpoints and things like that along the border a lot of them ended up staying because they weren't going to give up on the good thing they have of, of working in a in a uh, you know in a farm or wherever they were working and so instead what they would do is they'd send money back home stay here illegally and then eventually when they were able to build up something enough they'd smuggle their families in they weren't going to give it up so what usually was just people coming working and doing whatever and then leaving suddenly became a uh, you know people that were staying illegally so my thing is this uh if you get rid of the welfare state so that people that are coming here are coming here to work and you allow them to work so that they can provide for themselves and, and create opportunities and, and and all of that, then ultimately there's not really a, a threat. If if the and I, I will tell you, as someone who who went through the immigration process when I married my wife and sponsored her to come here, that process is not protecting us from anything. I mean, if you think government is inept, they're inept when it comes to homeland security, too. They asked my wife who is black, if she is a Nazi. She informed them because it's on the sheet of paper that they had to ask, are you a Nazi? She said, I'm black and my husband is Jewish. And they said, ma'am, this is this was a person whose job it is to identify threats to our republic and keep them out. The answer to a black woman telling him, I'm black, why are you asking me if I'm a Nazi? He said, or she said, I'm black and my husband's Jewish. He said, ma'am, your husband can be a Nazi if he wants to. He was born here, but you can't. Yeah, that's... This is who is in charge of protecting us. So it, this is not, you know, it, uh, very often when we, when we look at these agencies, we'll say, well, but they're protecting us. But then we look at what agencies actually do, and it's push paper, charge fees... Uh, to to run up this this uh, complex that they're running, but they're not really doing much to protect us. ICE and and the and the Border Patrol and and Homeland Security are doing no more to protect us from you know threats uh, crossing south of the border than uh, the CDC or the FDA are uh, protecting us from threats against our our health. If anything, they're often you know imposing even more threats to our health. Before we move to the next topic, I want to say, like, I'm going to generalize real quick, but left wingers, when it comes to America, a lot of their narrative is like, well, this is stolen land, right? You stole this from the Native Americans. Right, Everybody right, here right. is pretty much an immigrant because you're probably not from here. You probably came from Europe or somewhere else, or maybe you were, you know, a family of slaves. So there's that narrative of like, 
you know, it, this isn't our land. Like, who cares about the border? Who cares where you're from? No yeah, one's from yeah. here. You have no right to defend your homeland or, you know, like, let anything go pretty much. And then Even on the right. Native, yeah. <laughs> right. And on the right, a lot of people say, you know, well, no, you know, this is America now and we do have borders and we do have laws and we want to filter the amount of people coming through. And at a certain point, we have the right to say, listen, just like, uh, you know, if you own a nightclub or something where you're like, hey, we're full or, you know, we have homeless people on the streets of Los Angeles and, you know, our country is going to crap. So we want to close down immigration to some extent right now to a, to a bigger extent than we ever had. Uh, also, now that there's so many more people coming, it's like it's natural to want to push some away because we've never had this many people coming illegally. And there's a lot of people waiting a lot line legally. Where do you stand as a libertarian between those two arguments? Because I, I, I get both sides. But personally, I lean right where I think that because this is a country that people have the right to say, listen, I understand what we were founded on and these nice things. But, you know, we we have the right to close down immigration for a bit to figure out our own country. And you know, right. millions yeah. of people a year. It's just like uh, it, at a certain point, it just doesn't make logistic sense. Yeah. So um, I don't really uh, identify with either of those arguments. Um, it, it's interesting, the left wing argument of, you know, we you know, this is stolen land and people came here and, and they invaded. And and so therefore, you know, we should allow. And I, I always laugh at the, um, you know, they'll have this uh, gra around Thanksgiving, they'll have the graphic of the uh, pilgrims with the natives. And they'll say, you know, that we're commemorating the time that the, the indigenous people allowed in a bunch of undocumented immigrants or something like that. And I'm thinking, well, that's like the worst way to present your argument ever, because you're saying that the invaders that destroyed everything and, and stole the land were undocumented immigrants. I thought you wanted the undocumented immigrants to look. I've just always felt that to be a weird argument for them to make. Um, but here, here's what I will say. I, I look at this two ways. I look at it from a constitutional perspective and also from a property rights perspective. From a constitutional perspective, there's nothing in the Constitution that grants the uh, grants the government the authority to tell people who can or cannot come here. They allow for naturalization, but nothing to do with migration, which is why for the first hundred plus years of the U.S.'s existence, there was no policy when it came to who could or not could not come here. That changed in the 1880s when Democrat labor unionists finally got enough judicial activists in the Supreme Court to skew the definition of the Commerce Clause to say that people are commerce. But prior to that, that that totally unconstitutional ruling, uh, the Constitution itself says that, that there is no uh, enumerated power of government to do this thing. And according to the 10th Amendment, that means that that should be left to either the states or the people. So that's the, the legal constitutional argument. The property rights argument is that I don't believe that anyone has a right to tell you who you should be allowed to hire, host, or house on your property. It belongs to you. And as long as that person doesn't pose like a, it, you know, isn't someone that is a, you know, a threat to the safety of the public or something like that. You're not housing a, a murderer or a kidnapper or a rapist or something like that. As long as you are, you know, dealing with a person in, in what is otherwise a peaceful situation, I don't believe that anyone has a right to tell you who you can or cannot, you know, have on your property. Uh, when it comes to things like the, the fact that there's homeless people in the streets or anything like that, I, I don't see a correlation between the fact that someone coming here uh, to work and provide for and, and take part in the American dream. I don't see a zero sum game that that leads to some other person being homeless. I think the homelessness crisis in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Seattle and Portland and places like that are because of bad left wing policies in those areas. I, I don't believe it's because we're letting people here uh, to try to participate in the system. I will say this, though. The reason New York freaked out and Martha's Vineyard freaked out when all those migrants were sent there is because instead of having them there and then they can go and work and, and do whatever they want, they had to go and be put on the welfare system and Texas and the border states have been experiencing the strain on the welfare system because of the surge of very poor people who have nothing for quite some time. That's a very simple solution. Get rid of the welfare state or at the very least say, hey, listen, if you come here, fine, you come here, but there's nothing free here for you. If you want to come here, you participate in you know, our economy, you, you work, you start a business, you hire people, whatever you want to do, that's fine, but you're not going to get anything free here. I think that that would deal with a lot of it. So you think it should be uh, like unlimited immigration or no? 
I think that at the very least it should be streamlined. And I think that if you get rid of a lot of the ancillary issues that are causing the surges, we wouldn't be having the problem that we're having right now. It's still, yes, people would still come here. Lots of people would still come here. Lots of people have always come here. That's, that's nothing new. Um, but I don't think that it's, I, I don't think that the government should be setting quotas. I don't think that the government should, I don't trust the government to do the things that they say they're going to do. OK, if I if I trusted them to do that, then why wouldn't I trust them to tell me how to live my life to stop me from getting covid? What, why wouldn't I trust them to tell me what kind of firearm I should be able to own? Why shouldn't I trust them to tell me what kind of health care I should have and to provide it for me? Because I certainly can't be trusted for that myself. If I'm going to trust government in one thing, then why wouldn't I trust them in the other? And the thing is, I don't trust them on any of this stuff. I hear you. One thing I noticed with like, you know, the di diversity and like the left wing ism where it's like it's beautiful. Everybody's got great music, culture, food. You know, it's it's nice to travel. You know, I'm in on all that. But what I noticed is like, you know, China's not really diversifying that much. Like they're super Chinese. They're like a na national communist state. Um, yeah. You know, most countries aren't. It just seems to be like Europe where it's like Europe's just becoming non-white and, and America's becoming less white. And as it's happening, like all the media is basically like, I mean, I don't say this loosely, but it just seems like they're very negative about, you know, most European or white people and just oh, yeah. like super yeah. biased. And, you know, they've been like, just like going out of their, I mean, even from like fat to skinny now, it's like every model is like 500 pounds. It's like, you know, it, they just went <laughs> so far to please like the maybe minority groups in all categories to the point where it's gone so far. You know, I, I understand America is not Europe and it's definitely always been like a, more interesting country that's like like Germany's Germany, France, yeah, yeah, France yeah. and America. Everyone's coming from Europe and other places. But like at a certain point, do you think I understand that you don't think government can do it? But do people have like uh, the right to be like, well, I, this doesn't seem like it's going in the right direction. Like you guys clearly, you know, are are basically hating me. And then also, I think a lot of Democrats see the voting patterns of certain groups and they want to up those groups. And then as soon as their policies kind of weigh down on them, like in New York, then all of a sudden they, they notice it. So like, what is the, I understand it's a complex solution, but like what's going yeah. on and how, like, how would that be countered or solved? Like, like, do people have a right to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. So I, I, I will say there was a few things there, but uh, what I will say is that uh, anyone who's trying to uh, introduce idea the idea that being opposed to mass migration or even being opposed to migration instantly means that you're a racist uh i, I think it's something we need to do away with there are legitimate concerns when it comes to this stuff people look at the surges that are happening they're looking at you know at, at the cartels they're looking at the cartel violence that's happening right now and there's a natural inclination to say we need to have something there to try to protect it from coming over here whether or not that's a good policy or whatever else is 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 a, a, another issue you. But the fact that people are are seeing this and saying we need to do something doesn't mean that they're racist. And that, that's never been helpful. Uh, I will say I don't think we should be emulating Chinese policy in general. Um, but when it comes to the 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 fact that uh, the Western world is seeing a lot of migration that and, and is becoming, I guess, less majority white over time, that's a function of the fact that that these are the places where there's the most economic opportunity. Uh, and so, of course, people are going to go there. And it's interesting how that's changed over time, because like when my uh, dad's side of the family came here, we weren't considered white. Uh, we were considered, you know, Jews or, or Europeans. It, it's funny looking at some of the anti-migration uh, political cartoons and literature um, that was out in the 1700s and 1800s uh, against Germans and Scandinavian people coming here because they were going to mess up our, you know, our white bloodline. And it's just interesting how the definition of white continues to broaden. And, and now I guess the next group is the so-called white Hispanics. It's like they just keep broadening <laughs> right. the definition of white right. because to the to the the increasingly mainstream progressive left ideology white has an inherent like nastiness to it it's like a bad thing uh which i think is foolish um but to your question of do i think that people there i i, I want to make sure i understand what you're saying i think that people should be able to associate with whomever they wish to and i believe i even believe that people should be able to if they own a business refuse service to whoever they wish to i i think that if someone either doesn't like someone because of their race or their ethnicity or is suspicious of them or whatever, they have a right to associate or disassociate as they wish. The, the problem becomes when they tell you or me 
that we should associate or disassociate as they as we wish. Now it's no longer someone making their own choice and living by the consequences of that choice and others being able to choose based on what they've seen them doing. It's now I'm telling you what to do because I think that it's best for you and for whatever reason they think it's best for you. And and that whatever good intentions it may have, that's how you end up with lockdowns. That's how you end up with gun control. That's how you end up with all of it is people who are positive that they know better than you how you should live, not how they should live or how they want their community to be, but how you should live. And that's the stuff I oppose. Gotcha. Yeah, I think we agree on that. But it's like, uh, you know, it, it's a complex issue because on one hand, it's, it's, a, like, it's a complex issue. Yeah. Say with like race, you know, there's a lot of like black activists, black leaders, even black libertarians that will say like, you know, I'm libertarian, but I care about black people first or I'm a you know rapper. I want to give back to my people. Pretty much everyone can do that except for like white people. And I, white th people. Yeah. I think you brought up a good point, too, of like how I think this like white people thing is a new phenomenon, because when my grandfather came here, I'm Italian. Um, you know, there was a feeling about Italians. Every everyone had their yeah. own yeah. European or Jewish, like they all had their own kind of thing. And they were always like thinking they're better than everyone else. So this white thing is kind of a new thing. But it's now a group that you can only really identify as if you're just getting crushed. But not to be like, oh, I want to buy my own, you know, like everyone else can say that except for white. So I guess it's like, uh, you know, that's just sort of the thing, even with like immigration policies, a lot of times and same with, uh, you know, say schools, um, if you're Asians tend to do really well on average, I'm not gonna say all but you know, now they're getting discriminated against in schools as well because of that. So yep, I guess yep, that would yep, go yep. with your libertarian policy where if, if government isn't overreaching to make like racial, you know, priorities and quotas, then maybe things would naturally work their way out better than if like the government I, I, tried to intervene. I believe they would. I mean, listen, affirmative action has backfired, not just in in the fact that, you know, white people and Asian people are being punished for the fact that they're white and Asian, um, but also for the people that it was supposedly supposed to help. Um, you know, uh, that it, it, there, or at least there's quite a bit of, of, in many cases, especially the university they come out of, because of affirmative action, a lot of corporations and a lot of businesses and, and, and employers, when they're looking at black uh, graduates of whatever university, they think, oh, it's another uh, another affirmative action. And so what they do was they would put them in these, they call them diversity hires to meet their affirmative action quotas, either government imposed or ESG internally corporate culture imposed. And so what would they do? They'd put them in the the gender department, the, 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 the race or the ethnicity or the diversity department, which is now called the DEI department. But it's the same thing. It's the place we put people where we kind of have to hire them. And we would imagine they probably had to you know do lower standards to graduate but we have to hire them. So we just put them there. Well, how does that help them? Because it's not like, you know, you don't hear of people from the DEI department moving on to, you know, upper leadership positions. And I'm sure there are plenty of black people there who could have done so if they hadn't otherwise been hobbled from the beginning. There's a phrase that libertarians like to use a lot. Government breaks your legs, t steals your wallet, uses some of the money to buy you some crutches, and then says, hey, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have those crutches. And affirmative action is another example of that. They have hobbled people on both sides in the opposite ways, but they've hobbled them and then said, hey, look, we fixed it. No, you didn't. You made it worse. Right. And, uh, you know, it's funny where say like the NBA, the NBA, there is diversity naturally, um, but for the most part, it's just the best players. And they know they don't yeah. want to mess that up because they're making a lot of money off the best players. Luka Doncic is white European. He's there. Yeah. Uh, LeBron James is black. He's there. It's whoever's the best. But like whoever's all the, the diversity is always at like the lower levels Naturally where they think they there. could get away with it. Because I'm like, let's bring that same thing to the actual players. Well, it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't really make sense anywhere. You want to, you know, Luka, Luka Doncic is white, but he's not there because he's white to fill it yeah. out. He's there because he's actually really, really good. And I was uh, I was flying. I don't know if it was United or who, but it, there were two female minority like pilots on this huge thing. And they said, let's diversify the skies. And I'm like, listen, I like the pilot. I just want the guy <laughs> to be able to fly the plane and the engineer. Who flying. The, if it's an Indian a guy, pilot, Asian yeah. guy, you know, say whoever it is, like, don't I care. don't even know. But please do not diversify the most important things with this, because it's not going to be natural diversity. It's going to be forced i mean anti certain groups uh it's a it's a disaster i, I want to I, I i i hope that we can all agree that pilots should be chosen on their on their low likelihood of crashing 
I think right. that that should really be the 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 guide stone when it comes to choosing pilots. And if they're a black woman or a white guy or a freaking Cambo, I don't care. Like whatever they are, right. fantastic, great for you. First of your family to 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 be in a plane. Don't crash it. That's what I want right. to. I fly a lot. Don't crash the plane. That's literally all I care about. And the diversity is every person of every race pretty much agrees because when people are in the sky, they just don't want to fall out. You know, like, so. <laughs> diversity is a plane natural. full of people of all ethnicities, colors, political ideologies, religions, whatever, uh, right. colors, Try and everything else. Just not wanting to die. That's Agreed. that's the ultimate diversity. <laughs> right. Before we end, I, uh, and I want to talk about how libertarians could win more, but I want to talk yes. about the the police. And before we talk about yes. your, your stance on the police, I want to say maybe because libertarians tend to like me because I'm pretty libertarian. As you can see, I agree with pretty most like lower taxes, smaller government. I think the Republicans are honestly, I think they're a socialist party uh, acting like they're <laughs> patriots, but uh, and some would disagree, but whatever. But one yeah. thing that really, I, I mean, I got everybody coming out of the woodworks. It was kind of fun. I was like, dang, I, I just pissed <laughs> off the entire Libertarian Party on Twitter. My bad. But it was a police video, right? And there was this guy uh, that just got punched in the face. And yeah, I was, yeah. I, I said something along the lines of like, you know, I, I feel like there's more context or whatever. So I looked into it and there was this massive street brawl with like dozens of people. And I saw an earlier video and the police had told this guy to get away, get away, get away. You know, he kept trying yeah. to run into the crowd and eventually the guy just socked him. And that's kind of where a lot of people are like, oh, look how corrupt the, poli the police officer is there. And I know there are corrupt police. I'm not like back the blue yeah. to the death or anything. But in this one, I'm like, also to me, as somebody that doesn't like, obviously, like the high levels of the police state, I think what they're doing is terrible. As far as local police, like in my city in Los Angeles, I don't even think they're a top 10 problem. I mean, I think the crime is a problem. I think uh, like vi violent crime, murder is a problem in these huge cat. And I don't, I don't see the police... Uh, as this huge issue. I, I think the issue is like, you know, s certain groups and gangs just committing way too much crime, many of which on their own, on their quote unquote own people. Right. So um, I, I don't want to comment specifically on that video because I don't know the details of that. So I, I'll, I just want to preface with that. My take on the police is, is this. There's a very skewed idea of what the police are or are not. Um, and the thing is, there are multiple Supreme Court decisions. I think the most recent one was in, either in 05 or 08, but there's decades of Supreme Court precedent that it is not the police's job to protect you or to uh, to save your life or to protect your life. Basically, serve and protect that they don't actually have to do that. Their job is to enforce the laws and the rules and the regulations and the bylaws and the orders and, and all of that stuff. Their job is to make sure that government is done to you. So we often get caught up in like, I, I would hope that we agree that bad actors in any branch of government, including in the police, should be rooted out and that they should be held accountable for their actions. I, I would imagine we agree on that. Um, I would imagine that we agree that, uh, you know, whatever level of police are, are being used, it's, it should only be used to protect lives, rights and property. Here, here's the, the thing. We get caught up in like individual police officers or even individual departments. My take is that the institution of law enforcement is why we are able to have the tyranny that we have. If you remember during the lockdowns, you saw pictures and videos of you know people being uh, you know put in, uh, in in cop cars because they weren't wearing masks, or people that were being forcibly turned away from businesses because they weren't vaccinated and there was a vaccine mandate, or you know the, the most absurd stuff of of you know the guy at the beach sitting by himself at the on on a on a kayak and the police are coming out on a boat to arrest him. It wasn't Nancy Pelosi doing that. It wasn't Anthony Fauci doing that. It wasn't uh, uh, Chuck Schumer. For that matter, it wasn't Donald Trump or, or Mitch McConnell doing it. It was a, a group of people who were doing something that they may have completely disagreed with. They may have been told, yeah, you got to go out here and arrest this guy for kayaking by himself out, you know, hundreds of thousands of yards away from any other single human being. And they rolled their eyes and said, what a stupid thing. But they did it. And they did it for what is objectively the worst reason and the reason that justifies uh, or that has been used to justify the individual involvement in genocides and wars and everything else. It was their job. Their job is to do that. I like uh, in the school choice movement, 
the recognition that government should not be involved in this and that if government is going to take money from us, at, at the very least, that the parent should be allowed to decide directly where their children and the money assigned to their children go to school. Because it's an implicit recognition of two things. Number one, the government should not be doing this. They're not good at it. They shouldn't be involved in it. And number two, if they're going to force themselves into it, at the very least, the the the, the uh, consumer of that service uh, should be able to decide where it's going, which is why I support if, you know, if we're not just privatizing the police and, and making it so that we're hiring our own security services on a, on a, uh, community or neighborhood level, uh, at the very least, I support something like a police choice. Take the job of policing out of the hands of politicians and bureaucrats and cronies and put it in the hands of the people who have to live there. And I guarantee you, policing in Los Angeles would not look like how it does right now. Policing in places like uh, Minneapolis would not look like how it does now. It was, wouldn't look that way because the priorities of the police would be tailored to what the people want. Instead of focusing on the war on drugs and harassing motorists and uh, civil asset forfeiture, take, taking money from innocent people who have never even been tried for a crime, while standing down when riots happen and entire uh, communities are burned to the ground by rioters and looters, but then showing up to arrest Kyle Rittenhouse, instead the police would look like what people actually want. People whose only job is to protect lives, rights, and property. And again, I do not trust the government to do that. So if we're not going to completely, uh, you know, um, if we're not going to completely privatize the police or, or get government out of it entirely, at the very least, the decision for who should be hired to do these things should be decided by the people, not by a bunch of politicians and bureaucrats. I, and no police unions. We should not have public employee unions. If you live off of the taxpayer, you should not be negotiating with taxpayer dollars for how much more taxpayer dollars you should get. You're an employee of the people. You should not have a union representing you. In Los Angeles, I lived there for seven or eight years where it's like uh, the police have their hands tied by the politicians. They're not even allowed to enforce certain things. And as someone who lived there for eight years, I wouldn't even consider them a top 10 problem in the city. I would say like, the quality of people there is a, is a problem. You know what I'm saying? The culture there is a problem. Uh, and, and I would say that, the, like, I don't really consider them like a huge issue. It's just they're running around. People are breaking into stuff and they can't even arrest people because the politicians have decided that the criminals because it's have, their more, job. have more rights uh, than the people. But I guess my question would be this. Um, in a libertarian world, say you privatize the police. Like, I've had corrupt bouncers that are just as, if not more corrupt than... A police officer, you know, they're not paid by the government. They're paid by somebody. I don't know how yeah, much money, yep. but, you know, they yes. also can have an ego. They also could be corrupt. It's human nature. So I mm -hmm. guess I, you know, I understand the ideology behind it. But is it like in my and I tweeted this, I got in trouble. But like in New Hampshire or something, say like in an <laughs> area of like, you know, respectable libertarians, it's like, like you could take away the police and nothing would happen in a nice neighborhood for the most part. You could remove a lot of police and nothing would happen. But in the south side of Chicago, whether you have one police, a thousand police or 10,000 police, you know, mm -hmm. it's not cleaning up that city because the people there are not acting right. And, uh, you know, crime and violence and, you know, stealing and hurting your neighbor is is part of their culture, unfortunately, as opposed to so, not doing that. So I, I just don't think that privatized police would really solve anything. And I, I think that gangs, cartels or, you know, some sort of strong group would would take over uh you know what what the police had and it would get worse okay sorry my phone was on so Is there were basically two questions there I'll, I'll address the first one about what to do with with corrupt actors in, in anything. Anytime someone is corrupt, they need to be held accountable for it. And one of the problems is when it's a police officer or a, a CPS agent or a federal agent or uh, you know someone like that who's doing it, they get immunity. And even before they get immunity, they have a powerful public employee union closing ranks around them and you know protecting them from any kind of accountability for their actions. That in, encourages bad policing and bad actions by government and discourages good policing. So right off the bat there, if there's if there is anyone, please, if, if we're still staying in the government system or we privatize it or we we introduce do a, you know, a community based voucher system and let them hire their own people on a, on a community, level, whatever it is, bad actors need to be held accountable. The question of crime is the reality is that if Law, if government law enforcement didn't exist, gun control wouldn't exist in those areas. Uh, so people, good people, 
uh, the only people who follow gun control, law abiding people would no longer be uh, completely defenseless against people who are harming them. You would no longer have a monopoly on enforcement of laws, but a refusal to enforce them, which has led to all these smash and grabs and, and shoplifting and all the stuff that's happened, especially in, in uh, metro parts of California. Instead, you would have where people were enforcing that you can't rob people, you can't smash and grab, you can't shoplift. Uh, you also, um, uh, there's the, the there's the third thing I'm trying to remember now, but you, you would not have enforcement of the conditions that lead to higher crime. And hopefully in that situation, you also wouldn't have government involved in education, because as we know, uh, there's a direct correlation between bad education and higher crime and, and lack of economic opportunities and many other things. But just those two things alone, instead of having, oh, and the, the war on drugs, the reason that there's so much cartel and gang violence that we're seeing in our communities is the same reason it was happening 100 years ago during alcohol prohibition. You have the government via the police enforcing the cornered market, the black market of the cartels by banning anyone else from doing it. So the only people that are providing uh, drugs or in that back then alcohol, which is a drug as well, are the criminals, the people who don't care what the law is. And so as a direct result of that, you have the same thing you had 100 years ago during alcohol prohibition. The gangs are taking over and they're not just taking over, you know, violently taking over the streets. They're paying off police. They're paying off politicians. Some of them are even getting involved in politics. I mean, John Kennedy's dad was a rum runner. It's, it, no, there's no new thing under the sun. And what we're seeing yet again is that government enforcing a black market on something is creating a criminal is, is taking a bunch of two bit thugs who would have had to rely on the numbers game or, 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 you know, I guess hits on people to try to make money being given a multi billion dollar industry to themselves and it's empowering them and it's leading to more crime and more corruption. And so that's a yet another example of if instead you had people whose <clears throat> job was just to protect lives, rights, and property, you got a far better, and they aren't stopping you from doing so, you got a far better shake at being safer and protected anywhere, even in those those rougher communities. Yeah, I'm going to say a few things. I want to hear your response. Um, sure, sure. First of all, say say that I understand that the war on drugs, the government intervention, I agree on a lot of it. But let's take like, I, I don't know I'm off the top of my head, but like the 15 most dangerous neighborhoods in America, right? Like crime, a lot of like just, I mean, it's rough. And I would say certain American neighborhoods are worse than war zones. It's really, really bad. And it's really places, bad yeah. for the innocent people, you know, because it's not all people yep. doing crime. There's kids, mm -hmm. families, workers. It's it's a real community. And the people yep. suffering are the ones not doing the messed up stuff. You know, I don't think libertarianism could solve those communities. I don't think giving everyone the Second Amendment rights or private security. First of all, in, in lower uh, income communities, you know, it's harder to really put money together than a, like a wealthy neighborhood watch or something. So someone would have to pay for it or come together. And a lot of these neighborhoods can't come together. Something that I've noticed, I think that's tearing up these neighborhoods, I think is a combo of a few things. One, uh, father fatherless homes, you know, people not having yep. families together and self-policing. The welfare state, yeah. The welfare state, the culture. Yep. Yep. I, I'm a hip hop artist myself. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of really bad messaging in it where it, it doesn't, not only does it not work in poor or lower class communities, but it doesn't work if you're wealthy. Anyway. There's a lot of these rappers that have tens of millions of dollars that are ending up in jail, even though they have the money. So I, you know, this is a somewhat controversial to some, but I don't think poverty or race makes you a bad person where some people will be like, well, they're that, but they're poor. And I'm like, I don't think poor makes you necessarily a murderer or anything. I don't, I, I think there's no, certain, no, no, no. And no. there's certain communities I noticed, like say like Asians on average, like, you know, there's not a lot of like violent crime in the Asian community because their families stick together even more than like, yep. white families. Statistically, I just saw they had the yep. most family values and they're very strict on their children. But I notice in certain uh, like uh, high crime black neighborhoods where the culture of it, they almost get more mad when you try to point it out where it's like not only are they not really self-policing, but they've adapted this culture of like thinking that that's cool. And anybody trying to like fix it is like the problem, like it's the police's fault, it's your fault. So at that point, like how, how would libertarian fix that system when you have that type of culture and that type of mentality? Uh, me personally, I think a libertarian and a liberal could go to these neighborhoods with twenty trillion dollars, and they still wouldn't be able to fix it because it has to come with, from within. It's the same if you're doing meth and I'm trying to help you, and you just keep doing it. Where it's like I could help you, I could reach out a hand, but eventually these communities have to come together and self police themselves. Uh, and if they won't, I don't think the police are hurting them. I think the police are helping the you know the people who aren't up to no good in those neighborhoods. I don't I don't see them as bad.
Right. So there's a few things there, but I, what I'll focus on is you're hundred percent correct. If I had, you know, if I go into a community with $20 trillion, I'm just going to make a bunch of much wealthier people and the cost of living goes up, but the, the structural problems that are in place didn't change. I also don't think that government is a good way of dealing with cultural issues. And proof of that is that the, uh, the, the so-called war on poverty, uh, and the, which culminated mostly with the, the so-called, uh, new, not the new deal, the great society under LBJ, um, which was the, the beginning of the expansion, the massive expansion of the federal welfare state, we've seen a direct correlation with that with fatherless homes and with single parent homes because they actually, uh, and I'm, I know you know this, but for those who don't, they literally punished people for having two parent homes. Right. And instead they'd say, but if you have the, the, you know, the father living, uh, you know, off, then, you know, then, then you, if the father's not there, then you get more money. And so they were literally incentivizing. And it still happens anti- today. Today, oh, yeah, it, it still happens. happens. Yeah. It still happens today. And now you're multiple generations in where even if you remove that, some of that's ingrained. It's going to take a long time to undo that. So I'm not saying that the police, that that's the fault of the police or that if you if you created a, uh, you know, a, a voucher system uh, or, you know, for 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 choosing police uh, or or privatize the system, that it's going to solve the cultural problems in an area. It's certainly not. I think that overall things would be better, but I don't think that you would, because whoever is there, whoever's been hired to be there has one purpose, and that's to protect lives, rights, and property. And, uh, and I want to be clear on something. Even in the most dangerous community, the vast majority of people there are not criminals. They actually, they just right. want to get along to get by. They're just struggling to, 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 to live just like the rest of us are. And a lot of them are stuck there because because they can't afford to get out their their kids are stuck i say segregated into failing garbage schools and you know there's little hope for them to be able to get out of that that's that in and of itself is not the police's fault law enforcement enforces the conditions that allow for a system like that to thrive and that's the problem is that the police's primary role there, even if they are also protecting people that's not their primary role their primary role there is to enforce government and its orders and in the prioritization of what politicians say is needed not the people that live there if the people that live there the actual stakeholders who live there were in charge of saying this is what i want the police to do they wouldn't be going around harassing motorists and arresting people for a joint and standing down when riots are happening that was one of the most frustrating thing during during any of these riots that have happened is that they try to say that you know criticism of rioting is racist and they silence the people who live there many of whom are black and brown who are saying no our community is being burnt down. You don't live here. Stop cheering them on. That was the most frustrating part of all of that was watching people, very often white progressives who live in neighborhoods that are a lot more similar to mine, cheering on riots because they're nowhere damn near them and didn't care what was actually happening there. So I, I want to say that's not the fault of the police. The conditions that allow for the cultural changes that lead to that kind of stuff are enforced by law enforcement. It's not the politicians enforcing it. It's law enforcement. I don't think that switching to a better system, a more accountable uh, and competitive system of law enforcement is going to solve all the problems, but it's at the very least going to begin to address the root causes from government that have contributed to those things being worse. And whoever is there, whoever's been hired, their only role, their primary and, and only role is protecting lives, rights, and property. And the people there who are good, who vastly outnumber the criminal element, are now able to defend themselves and to stop people from uh, rioting and looting and stealing and so forth. I think we agree on, you know, government intervention over the last like 50 years, making a lot of situations worse. Way I guess worse. one thing, and, and this is really outside of even government, but say in like, you know, uh, uh, and black culture is very uh, like a, a broad term, but a lot of people like at rappers and say like uh, Charlemagne the God, if you ask them, I'm sure they would say I, like I do black culture, you know, that they take pride in it where it's like the there's not a lot of people self policing. It's almost like in in these cultures, uh, it's cool to to do these wrong things. But then if you try to correct it, you're a sellout or, you know, even before kind of. They talked about the Jewish stuff. He was really big on self-policing his own people and saying, hey, listen, we got to stop acting this way. We got to buy land. Like, let's talk about property and stop yep. killing each other. And he was this was before he even said anything like semi-controversial. The rap community hated him for it. So at what point it's like whether it's libertarianism, government intervention, I don't think these neighborhoods are ever going to change until the mentality changes, because I know, you know, and I understand that poverty and bad situations and government intervention can hurt. 
But as far as I know, my grandfather came to this country and worked at a trash station, but they had a certain mentality where it's like, if you saw, you know, your community get out of line, you put them back in line. But there are certain yeah. communities where it's almost like that they have the opposite mentality where it's like, no, that's what we want to do. And if, if anybody tries to like correct us on that, then you're the problem. It's your fault. It's the police. It's that community. It's like the violence is not going to stop. The crime's not going to stop. And the sad part is all of this fake left wing unity where you see like the NFL writing phrases on you know, uh, the end zones of like, stop hate. And it's like, yeah, hate's bad, bro. We all it know. Means, Thank it you. means I, nothing. You, yeah. You yeah. My, that does. But, but you, what I'm virtue saying is like signal it, received. Yeah. If you yeah. watch left wing media, it's all of this black unity and stuff. But if you go to not every community, obviously, but like a lot of these, uh, communities with high crime, it's, it's mostly black people killing each other, uh, in these communities. So it's like, I find it just very hypocritical from the media. And I think it's a scary topic to talk about because you don't want to seem racist, but it's like, they're talking about all this unity and pride and all this, but then the communities where that's clearly not happening and like black 11 year old girls are getting shot and it's disgusting and it's evil. And it's yeah. like, you want to save these people, but they get more mad at you for trying to save them. Like, I don't think a, a kid of that age, black or white should have to walk to school thinking about a bullet going through their head. But then it's like, they don't even want to talk about it because they just want to talk about this fake liberal world that they've created for wealthy people. Uh, you know, like, oh, you know, look at my helmet. Look what it says on it. You get $20 million a year, bro. But you know damn well if you right. walk down this street with a chain. I mean, you can't even walk down Beverly Hills with a chain on anymore. People are getting robbed for their Rolexes and stuff. So it's like this country is not safe anymore. And I think the the narrative needs to be, in, in my view, although I think government is obviously responsible for a lot and police are not perfect. But I think there needs to be a lot less anti, well, the police are doing all this and more like we also got to do better because honestly, like the police are not going to be able to make or break you to that extent. You got to kind of pull the weight yourself a little bit because I don't it, like on the South side of Chicago. Do I think like, are the police the number one problem there? Like I'd be lying if I said, I thought so. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't right, even consider right. them a top five. Yeah. Yeah. So um, again, there was a lot of stuff there, but the, uh, what, here's what I'll say at one point, black culture was people who were coming out of slavery and building their own Wall Streets and their own neighborhoods that even in the midst of things like Jim Crow and and post reconstruction uh, crackdowns on black people and over criminalization and all those things, even in the midst of that, they were building places like Harlem and they were building places like uh, Black Wall Street and Rosewood uh, and, and places like that. And even when they would get burned down, they'd rebuild them. And at one point, the the gap uh, between the average black family, black households wealth and the average white households wealth was almost at parity. And the and the what year? Real quick. Do you know what year that was? Because like, this would be have been 1900s. this would have been sometime in the late uh, 1500, uh, oh, 1500s, the late 1950s, early 1960s. And at the same time, the uh, out of wedlock, the, the number, the number of intact families, two parent families was higher among black people than among white people. And then here came LBJ to incentivize to finally find a way to break black communities. And that was right. through the welfare state. I agree. Uh, uh, Jay-Z, and you know who Jay-Z is, but Jay-Z, he rapped, how long did he rap about uh, you know, drug dealing and killing, mostly killing black people and 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 victimizing black women and calling black people the N-word and calling black women the B-word and, and all that. And that was all fine. That was that was entertainment. It was fine. And then he did a song called The Story of OJ. And um, in and part of that song, he talked about the fact that black people should be doing what Jewish people did and right. by their community. And he was accused of anti-Semitism. <laughs> right, he was accused right. of, of how dare you insinuate that Jewish people own lots of New York City. I mean, it was ridiculous. Like the things that were being said, but right. what was happening there? The, the corporate media narrative was being upset with one rap song by a guy who's saying, hey, actually, maybe we should be taking back our communities and not just saying whose streets are streets in some feudal protest where we right. go back to homes that we don't own, but actually like building our own communities and engaging in, uh, you know, in, in, in internal economics. And like you said, policing our own when there are bad actors calling them out, we should be doing these things. And, and I, I will say this is not specific to just to black people, right? Like this is not a black problem. They may be, may be the most disproportionately affected by it. I'm not going to pretend to say I know the statistics from race to race or anything like that. But but here's what I will say. If a person, and especially if a community of people 
is focused on the on trying to gain political power, on trying to uh, to to lobby for government to do a thing for them. It is effectively, if you distill it down, no different than a child telling their parent, I want this. And the behavior that's going to come out of that desire for political power, which is basically, again, throwing a tantrum to your parents or, or has the same dynamic as that, you're going to have other childish behaviors. If instead the primary focus is on economic and social power and cultural power, building up your communities so that you're independent and self-sufficient and can call the shots for yourselves, that's adult behavior. And it's going to lead to other ancillary adult behaviors happening. And what do you know, when the white progressives in academia who set up the NAACP and cherry picked the uh, Ivy League educated light skinned black people that they would have lead it uh, and, and and took away uh, the the uh, the narrative from uh, uh, from black people that were advocating for you know black people to build up their communities like Marcus Garvey and um, names are escaping me right now but people like Booker that Malcolm X and, and other yeah. Booker that's who it was Booker T Washington yeah. Marcus Legends. Garvey even Malcolm X later on right. and instead promoting uh, people like W E B Du Bois uh, and, and folks like that right, and, and right. the new generation with Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and and Sean King and whatever else. When you do that, you are encouraging people to participate in a system that is rigged against them from the beginning in a, to, to, as minorities, appeal to a majority rule system and to put your primary focus on asking for someone to give you a thing, even though a lot of it was robbed from you in the first place, but ask for someone to give you a thing. And that promotes that engaging, telling people to engage in a primarily childish behavior or something that at its root is a, a behavior that children would, will engage in will lead to other childish behaviors. Because instead of saying this is about responsibility, self-ownership, autonomy, respect, it's actually about, you know, give me things and do things for me. You're going to have more of that kind of behavior. And, and I think that the the breaking of black communities, I would argue by design, maybe it was with the best of intentions. I, I don't know. Call me crazy. I don't think LBJ had the, the greatest of intentions. Yeah. Uh, but but doing that broke black communities and, 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 and is now being used to break all sorts of communities. And the template for that was actually started with native people. They use those same policies to break native communities. And we see where that's left them. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the Jay-Z thing, too. I mean, I think he said something about, do you know how Jewish people own all the property in America? He said credit. That's how they did it. And then the song was kind of about like economic freedom. And yes, the, even if you're offended by what he said, the fact that they got more mad at that or they got so mad at Kyrie Irving or, you know, even Ye at the beginning where it's like just threat, just just talking about that sends a shockwave so and that's actually what Ye was talking about in certain interviews he's like why can certain executives that happen to be jewish profit off of this music that is killing black people but if i talk about that then that's the problem he's like why isn't it a problem when there's when there's executives profiting off this music and you know i want to say real quick like uh like black culture and true black culture like i know like uh smoky robinson uh stevie wonder i can name hundreds of people is beautiful and a lot of these older I understand that music evolves, but a lot of these older people, when they had their music sampled, they wouldn't approve of the song because they're like, I don't like these lyrics. Like, you can't yeah, remake yeah, my yeah, song yeah. with these garbage lyrics. Um, yeah. So I think that you you hit a lot of real points where the government kind of sigh out people and they're still doing it. So I guess that's kind of, you know, that's outside of the uh, policy. But that's something I'm really trying to crack through, because I think that once people change the mindset, that's when the government tricks don't work on them. And that's when people are able to seek the right things. But I think you nailed it. Once you kind of get tricked into the, you know, the trap, that's when you kind of stay there. So it's a tough thing when to crack through because, yeah, you, you, it, you know, like it's easy to get called racist nowadays. But you're like, my goal is that an 11 year old girl won't walk down the street and get shot. I don't think that's normal. And I don't want to normalize that. And a lot of people do want to normalize. And it's like, regardless of economic situation, if we love our neighbors and we love the, you know, the children in the community, it's like we have to have a zero tolerance policy for this stuff. It's like we have to police our own neighborhoods, whether the police do it or not. I agree 100%. It's it's another part of why I'm so pro Second Amendment is that I think that people 
on an individual level and on a community level should be and 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 need to be self-reliant on being able to defend themselves. And I, I, I will tell you this, uh, someone who in the same way that every mass shooting that has happened has happened in a so-called no gun zone because shooters want to be able to get as big of a body count as they can before they get stopped uh, right. or, or even possibly even be able to survive and go to go to court like many of these mass shooters did. Whereas, right. you know, they're not going to go to a gun show. How many mass shootings have there been at gun shows? Zero. Right. Everyone's going to be it, strapped. Everyone, a mass shooting is going to turn into a mass getting shot at, right? Like there was one guy who tried to shoot up a church in Texas. He apparently didn't get the memo. And when he showed up, I think he was able to kill one person. And there was like 50 shots that hit him. And he, I mean, he died immediately. And and that's the difference between a mass shooting and a mass shot at is uh, people being able to defend themselves. I think a lot of these communities, if these, if the 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 criminal element knew that that 11 that that the 11 year old kid has got a parent near them or behind them or some other person there who's going to cap them if they try to put any kind of pull any kind of nonsense and or the the old lady who's walking down the street that you know is going to get mugged that she could pull something out and, and equalize that very quickly uh i think that that's a, a very big uh step towards uh being able people being able to protect themselves from a cultural aspect uh if someone is if someone is encouraged to get into a cage and then spend their lives advocating for the cage to be as as you know comfortable as possible it, it's going to lead to prisoner style behaviors and it's it just it is what it is and i i think that after many years uh of trying to I think it started with trying to break indigenous and black communities. And once they got the formula down on, on how to break the communities from within by by helping them and giving them stuff, uh, they've now exported it out to everyone. They're trying to do it to the middle class now. They're, they're literally trying to to turn everyone into a uh, essentially a, 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 a fee for a, or a. a um, you know, an extension of government or someone that's entirely reliant on government and uh, and a surf for the government. And, uh, you know, it started with certain communities and now it's expanding out to other ones. And you see there's obviously going to be cultural reverberations from that. And I, I think we need to be talking about economics. And frankly, I think that the Jews are a good uh, a, a, a good template in many ways for that. Here are people that were escaping pogroms and, and genocide, but because they engaged in a lot of economically sound and culturally, like familially sound behaviors, they've been able to claw their way out of that. Why wouldn't we talk about that and emulate it? Why wouldn't we celebrate the fact that Jay-Z did a song? What, because he said Jews own all the land in NYC? God forbid the man be hyperbolic, right? And 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 and, and not just say that he they own a lot of it or, or disproportionate amount of it. I, I think that it's good to have those kinds of conversations. And I think that it's good because he wasn't vilifying Jews. He was right. saying, here is a way that they did it. Why don't we do that? And it was fine for him to talk about killing ends and and doing whatever he wanted to bees. But once he was saying, you know, hey, let's let's, you know, try to emulate some some economically and culturally positive behavior. That was the the unspoken right. thing. that but, you can't But say. I think also that's sort of thing where uh, in the Jewish community, especially with all these anti-Semitism laws, they've kind of gatekeeped uh, criticism against themselves. So now you have a lot of wealthy liberal Jewish men who are capitalizing off the murder of black men. But if you call it out, they get mad, you know, where it's like they want to just keep profiting off the death of black people. But, yeah, you know, what, God forbid, a, one of their black artists calls them out by name. They freak out because it's like you're supposed to just kill each other so we can make money off you. Like, how dare you notice that we're doing it? You know, right. So in the same way, uh, here's what I want to say, because I, I am Jewish. Um, yeah, the you're vast not majority it, but... of the, the vast majority of Jews have nothing to do. They have no no access to any kind of power. They're not calling any kind of shots. Jews are disproportionately represented in positions of power and authority, primarily because of the uh, the reliance on getting uh, 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 within Jewish communities, getting them into fields of law and getting them into fields of medicine and things like that, where they end up in those situations. And then what happens with any person is that often when they when they will get into a higher and higher positions of authority, it often corrupts them. But the reality is the majority of people in those positions are not Jews, and more importantly, the vast, vast majority of Jews have nothing to do with that. Right. And, it, and the majority, and the majority of Black people are not killing people in the streets. Exactly. But but, yes. but but still, these things need to be policed. And same with, I think, the Jewish community. Uh, not everybody, obviously, but they spend more time trying to tell people that they're not allowed to criticize or compliment them. So a lot of people at high level positions have become wicked and. 
you know, just like if a white man or a black man was profiting off the death of another man, it should be called out. And there are a lot of Jewish that executives. That, there are a lot of Jewish executives that are profiting off the death of black people and they don't want to be noticed. So it's not it's not to blame every Jewish person. But, you know, that's kind of I, I think in Italian community, white community, black there's certain like people don't want to self police certain things. So that's like, that's what I'm saying. Even in the black, most black people are not killing people in the streets, but it seems yeah. like culturally, if you call that out, people spend more time rejecting the thought of that even happening than they are interested in being like, Oh yeah. We're even when you're talking about mugging people in the streets, I understand that there's historic things and terrible things, but we got to draw a line and be like, listen, I don't care how poor you are. I don't care what color you are. You can't be just beating oh, up old people. Yeah, no, and, you know, yeah. Rob, yeah. robbing others um i want to ask real quick about the how to win for libertarians because i think that yes. a lot of these you know i think they could really push and i don't mean right wing like extreme like the media i'm talking about like economically like closer to actual republicanism how does the libertarian party you know win seats or at least maybe leverage their power to create a coalition where this is just an idea i've always had where you get a lot of libertarians to be like listen we're going to we'll maybe vote for you. We can ruin your election. You know, we could take 10 percent of the vote, ruin your whole election, give it to a Democrats. Is it yeah. possible that libertarians could use their power of voters to basically like not lobby, but leverage the Republican Party to actually be conservative and libertarian? I, I think that that would probably like as the Libertarian Party grows, I think there would be steps. I think the first step is that they can leverage having a larger share of the vote to actually push politicians to do what they're going to say or else they'll keep them out of office. Then the next step becomes at some point they become the second party. And unfortunately, in our system and, and Devergé's law predicted this a long time ago, anytime you have first past the post electoral electoral systems, as long as that's in place, ultimately the public is going to largely fall into one of two camps because they recognize that if you don't vote for this side, this side is much more likely to win and, and the whole concept of vote splitting and all of that. So I think that there's steps to it. But to the, the basic question of how does the Libertarian Party grow to any extent, to the extent of being able to do that, to the extent of being able to even, you know, make it to the debate stage uh, so that we can, you know, be on debate stages for for president and things like that uh, and win more elections. Uh, the this, the the basic answer to that is that we need to grow the liberty movement and we need to focus on where we're already winning. There are hundreds of elected Libertarian Party members right now, but they're at local races. And we spend so much time talking about the presidential race and the Senate race and the gubernatorial race, even though we're not at the size yet where we've ever been able to win a single one of those. And yet here we are winning hundreds of races across the country, and we ourselves are barely even talking about it. How do we expect you to know or talk about it if we're not focusing on it? So I like that the Libertarian Party uh, has started to prioritize the more local races, prioritize building um, uh, single issue coalitions with other groups at the local level, especially and focusing on on nullification laws to, to show that even at the local level, they can do a lot to uh, to hamstring the uh, the tyrannical things they see at the state and federal level in their communities uh, and, and on using it as a platform for messaging. I think those are all all good things. But there's one thing that has to be, and this is actually why I started my organization, You Are the Power. A lot of people don't want, they might vote Republican, Democrat, whatever, but they don't want to participate in something that's tied to a political party. They aren't political. And so what we're doing with You Are the Power is we are growing the liberty movement by finding people who are in need of help, or usually they're finding us and telling us about it, finding people who are in need of help helping them to get justice, helping them to get what they need, helping the communities to organize around that, showing people these things and, and helping them to get organized around it, and then using it as an opening conversation in those communities about the fact that we do better when we are most free and that the problems that are happening in our communities are largely or very often either being, being caused or made worse by the fact that there is too much power in the hands of too few people. We need to be hammering that message home over and over again. And we also need to recognize something very simple. A lot of voters are not going to vote for us if they don't think we're going to win. And that's the most maddening and frustrating thing on earth, because if they voted for us, we could win, but they're not going to vote for us because they don't think we can win. Right. And so what the Libertarian Party needs to do is show that we can win by focusing on the races where we do win. And what the beauty of that is that when we show them that we can win, we also show them that unlike when Republicans and Democrats win, when we, when we win, 
they win too. When we win, their taxes go down. When we win, their services are provided better. When we win, people that are bad actors in government are held accountable. When we win, you have more control and authority over your lives. When we win, you don't have to worry about lockdowns or mandates or any of that other nonsense. When we win, you win, your community wins, and things are better because we recognize that you can do better for yourselves than any politician, even, even libertarian politicians, ever could, that we do best when we are most free. That's what our focus needs to be on. I like the local stuff real quick. Um, what do you think about this kind of leverage? I, I know it's not a European system, but you could almost kind of like Jerry rig it to make it like that. Like say there's a national election, right? It's Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. Trump's yeah. polling at 45%. Biden's at 43%. And Dave Smith comes around and you or something and it's like 7%. And they're freaking right, out. They're right. like, oh my God, you know how like Republicans <laughs> tend to hate libertarians. You guys are going to steal our election. You guys are taking our votes. What if you can't, <laughs> would you ever use your power and be like, listen, we identify we can't win. But we, we're not just going to roll over for you guys because we have a movement, too. You have to sign this piece of paper that says you're going to lower income tax or abolish. Like, you know, use your yeah. your kind of vote as leverage to make the Republicans actually do libertarian stuff. Is that is that a possibility? I don't trust them enough to say, hey, if you sign this piece of paper, because they they hold up a, a, their hand and swear on a Bible or on whatever they want to swear on that they'll uh, protect and defend the Constitution. And it, with the fact with both Joe Biden and Donald Trump, we saw that that was all a bunch of garbage. Here's what I would be willing to do, however, and I'm sure Dave would say the same thing and and Justin Amash or anyone else uh, uh, that that's running would would say the same thing, is that while we may not say, OK, we'll drop out of the race and endorse you if you sign this thing, what we what I would say is, hey, look. You want me not to take votes away from you? You want me to not spoil the race? Uh, you want you want you want to get the votes that would otherwise go to me? Then say what I'm saying. I'm staying in the race all the way to the end, but say what I'm saying. And then better yet, once you get into office, do what I said that I would do and that you just said that you would do. And so it's not a it's not a de facto agreement. But, you know, if we're getting double digits or we're getting 7 percent or 15 percent or whatever else, and God forbid we make it on the debate stage, you actually have to answer directly to us while we're standing there right next to you all the facade of you being up here and us being down here right. is gone because we're right on the same stage say the same thing we're saying if we're growing in power if we're growing in popularity and in and in you know a uh, 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 prestige within the population then then emulate what we're saying and better yet when you get into office do what you said you were going to do because next time because all you just did was if you say what we said and then do the opposite you just told the public that we were right and that you were a hypocrite and you were going to fail them that's what i'm willing to do right and getting on the debate stage would be huge i guess just real quick th thank you for your time spike uh, let people know where they can find you and i just want to say real quick i like i would say i have a mixture audience like pretty open-minded but definitely obviously right-leaning probably way more sure. republican voters you know the the typical republican criticism of libertarians would be you know libertarians are too liberal they're too weak it's they're too naive <laughs> and uh someone had asked yeah. a question of like what's your stance on like a 13 year old should a 13 year old if the parents agree uh should they be able to get like a surgery and remove their breasts or you know genitals or something like and should the government stay out of it so that was like a three-part thing but i wanted to like fit that in because i know you got to run soon. i i don't i don't think that teenagers should be getting uh, uh surgeries that are uh, unless they're medically necessary and i i I will say I actually I got some flack because a while back I said, you know, listen, I don't I don't want the government getting involved in this stuff. If 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 a if a child is is having their gender affirmed, why is that the government's uh, fault, uh, the government's business? At the time, I didn't realize that there were already places that were giving hormones to young children or, you know, doing surgeries on on uh, children as young as I think 13, 14 years old. I think that that stuff is absolutely ridiculous. I, I will say this that these uh, providers need to smarten up because what's going to happen if they keep pushing this stuff, the government is going to be involved. The pendulum is going to swing the other way where now they're having to fight if a, if a teen does actually need a mastectomy for medically necessary reasons and the government is holding it up because of this stuff, it's going to go in the other way. Government always makes things worse. I do not think government is the answer to this. It's another cultural problem that, that government is not the answer to. But I think that if you are a medical provider and, and you are getting involved in this, you need to really think twice about what you're you are inviting 
when this happens, when this correction happens, and it, it'll yeah. always be an overcorrection, cultural corrections are always overcorrections. It's a pendulum swinging back and forth. And, and I know you know that, that point, yeah. it's going to be because of that. Big it's pharma and big, that. big pharma and big medical. They're, they're so far gone that I, I don't think they even care, but what, what, where can people find you? And I guess what would be your last pitch to people that say, you know, I'm a Republican. I like certain libertarian policies, but it's too weak and too naive. That's Sure. So I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, if you want to follow me, uh, I'm on Facebook, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok for the kids and the and the Chinese government. Um, so I'm on all of the different platforms. <laughs> if you look for Spike Cohen, you will find me. Uh, I think I said I'm on it. If I didn't say I'm on Instagram, I'm also on Instagram and I'm on YouTube and all that. Uh, my website is SpikeCohen.com. My organization, You Are the Power, the website is YouAreThePower.net. We are also on Facebook and Instagram and uh, Twitter, YATP official. Uh, and then to answer the, I mean, it's a kind of a broad question, but here's the thing. I don't think it's naive to say that you know better how to live your life than some politician who does not know you. I don't think it's naive to say that any system is not going to be a utopia, but that a system that respects your autonomy, respects your rights, and does not interfere with you living your life peaceably and defending yourself uh, against those who would do you harm, I don't think it's naive to say that that's going to be a far better system than the one that we have. And while I, I used to be a Republican, and I voted for Republicans because they said that they were going to reduce the size of government and that they were going to cut taxes and cut spending and that they were going to reduce regulations and we were going to be closer to the constitutionally in, in, uh, uh, enshrined republic that we were promised. And every single time they failed because they can. So if for no other reason than to hold them accountable by saying, I'm not going to vote for you. And I recognize you're not substantively different from the Democrats. So I don't win it, care if the Democrats beat you. I'm voting for something that actually for someone that actually says they're going to do what they said that they were going to do. I would encourage you to vote libertarian or vote constitution party or whatever, vote independent, whatever. Just stop voting for the uniparty because it is a scam. It is a good cop, bad cop routine. And every time you vote for it, you are telling them whatever you do to me, no matter how much you lie to me, no matter how big of a bunch of hypocrites you are, no matter how much you demonstrate that no matter who I vote for, I get John McCain, I'm still going to vote for you. And that means they're still going to do it. So for no other reason, hold them accountable. Uh, but like I said, I don't think it's naive to say that you should be able to live, your, you should be able to dictate your life and, and not some bureaucrat or, or uh, crony or, or, or politician. And I appreciate thank this opportunity for us to talk, man. I think it's really good that we got to do this. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. And uh, I end up sharing libertarians more than Republicans on Twitter because, uh, you know, <laughs> although I know, unfortunately, they haven't run campaigns to really get there. I think the Republican base could benefit from really listening, even to things you disagree with from Spike or, or, or even myself. And just take yeah. some of it, because if you take that energy to these turning point of and these Republican things like I like having a good time. I like meeting people and networking, but people are like roaring in applause for these politicians like Ted Cruz and stuff. And I'm like, listen, like you got to start <laughs> booing or at least putting this pressure on it, because really, yes. if you are a conservative and you are a Republican, even if you're not libertarian, the Republican Party is too far left. They're going further left. They print the money. They act like socialists. I mean, they are on record a socialist party and people. What do you mean? You know, it's like so I, I love I appreciate oh, listen, your perspective and I, wa I, I, I want I, that I, energy. Go ahead. I have to say this. And I'm not going to go into a whole thing. The Republican Party was founded as a neo-Marxist party. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. They were founded under neo-Marxist principles. And sometime along the way, they started pretending to be constitutionalists. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. But that's I, I only learned that in the last maybe 10 years. That was one of the final strings with me where I was like, oh, wow, even the roots of the party were neo-Marxist. Uh, the Chicago Trumpet, which was the official Republican Party newsletter uh, or newspaper, what would routinely quote from the Communist Manifesto, uh, it, was, it, it was a neo-Marxist party. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. I didn't know that, but I mean, they <laughs> act like they act like a controlled opposition party so it wouldn't yes. be surprising to me and i just want exactly. the base to realize that no matter what way you vote or if you don't vote just try to obviously like peaceful and friendly but like you know don't just like cheer for these people like rock stars really look at what they do don't just listen to their words i know trump is a funny guy i liked him for a while too you know look <laughs> at the actions because if he ends up governing like a democrat or like a big pharma guy you know it's okay for you the what voter the that's all the power you have is to call it out 
because at this rate, we're really not going to get results. So we do need to, you know, really put a little pressure peacefully, legally. I, I have to say that because then if somebody like knocks down a wall or something, they'll be like, he watched Anomaly. It's, I'm like, Anomaly, no, Anomaly I'm not, I'm not, told I'm, them to I'm, destroy I'm talking about everything. Boom, yeah. boom, or, you know, just put a little bit of like, OK, we Mate. know that you, you failed last time. And people, But it was them. I'm like, dude, they're going to it's. George Bush, it's going to be the same story for 40 years. We definitely have to let them know that we're, we, we're awoke to it. And then maybe we'll get some results. Make booing Ted Cruz great again. <laughs> Dude, thank you. I'll put that on a bumper sticker, get a lawsuit. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. <laughs>